Is your ladyship at home this afternoon? Yes. Who has called? Lord Darlington, my lady. Show him up. And I'm at home to anyone who calls. Yes, my lady. It's best for me to see him before tonight. I'm glad he's come. Lord Darlington. How do you do, Lady Windermere? How do you do, Lord Darlington? No, I can't shake hands with you. My hands are all wet with these roses. Aren't they lovely? They came up from Selby this morning. Ah, they are quite perfect. And what a lovely fan. May I look at it? I do. Pretty, isn't it? It's got my name on it and everything. I've only just seen it myself. It's my husband's birthday present to me. You know today's my birthday. No, is it really? Yes, I'm of age today. Quite an important day in my life, isn't it? That is why I'm giving this party tonight. Do sit down. I wish I had known it was your birthday, Lady Windermere. I would have covered the whole street in the front of your house with flowers for you to walk on. They are made for you. Lord Darlington, you annoyed me last night at the Foreign Office. I'm afraid you're going to annoy me again. I, Lady Windermere. Put it there, Parker, that will do. Won't you come over, Lord Darlington? I'm quite miserable. Lady Windermere, you must tell me, uh, you must tell me what I did. Well, you kept paying me elaborate compliments the whole evening. <laughs> ah, nowadays we're all of us so hard up that the only pleasant things to pay are compliments. They're the only things we can pay. No, I'm talking very seriously. You mustn't laugh. I am quite serious. I don't like compliments, and I don't see why a man should think he is pleasing a woman enormously when he says to her a whole heap of things he doesn't mean. Ah, but I did mean them. I hope not. I should be sorry to have a quarrel with you, Lord Darlington. I like you very much, you know that, but I shouldn't like you at all if I thought you were what most other men are. Believe me, you are better than most men, and I sometimes think you pretend to be worse. We all have our little vanities, Lady Windermere. Why do you make that your special one? <laughs> oh, nowadays so many conceited people go about society pretending to be good that I think it shows rather a sweet and modest disposition to pretend to be bad. <laughs> Besides, there is this to be said. If you pretend to be good, the world takes you very seriously. If you pretend to be bad, it doesn't. Such is the astounding stupidity of optimism. Don't you want the world to take you seriously then, Lord Darlington? Oh no, not the world. Who are the people the world takes seriously? <laughs> All the dull people one can think of, from the bishops down to the boars. I should like you to take me very seriously, Lady Wildermere. You, more than anyone else in life. Why, why, why me? Because I think we might be great friends. Let us be great friends. You may want to, you may want a friend someday. Why do you say that? Oh, we all, we all want friends at times. I think we're very good friends already, Lord Darlington. We can always remain so as long as you don't. Don't what? Don't spoil it by saying extravagant, silly things to me. You think I'm a Puritan, I suppose? Well, I have something of the Puritan in me. I was brought up like that. I'm glad of it. My mother died when I was a mere child. I lived, with, I lived always with Lady Julia, my father's elder sister, you know. She was stern to me, but she taught me what the world is forgetting, the difference that there is between what is right and what is wrong. She allowed of no compromise. I allow of none. My dear Lady Windermere. You look on me as being behind the age. Well, I am. 
I should be sorry to be on the same level as an age like this. You think the age very bad? Yes. Nowadays, people seem to look on life as a speculation. It is not a speculation. It is a sacrament. Its ideal is love. Its purification is sacrifice. Oh, anything is better than being sacrificed. Don't say that. I do say it. I feel it. I know it. The men want to know if they are to put the carpets on the terrace for tonight, my lady. You don't think it will rain, Lord Darlington, do you? Oh, I won't hear of it raining on your birthday. Tell them to do it at once, Parker. Yes, my lady. Do you think then, of course I'm only putting an imaginary instance, do you think that in the case of a young married couple, say about two years married, if the husband suddenly becomes the intimate friend of a woman of, well, more than doubtful character, is always calling upon her and lunching with her and probably paying her bills, do you think that the wife should not console herself? Console herself? Yes, I think she should. I think she has the right. Because the husband is vile, should the wife be vile also? Vileness is a terrible word, Lady Wondermere. It is a terrible thing, Lord Darlington. Do you know that I am afraid that good people do a great deal of harm in this world? Certainly the greatest harm they do is that they make badness of such extraordinary ex importance. It is absurd to divide people into good and bad. People are either charming or tedious. I take the side of the charming. And you, Lady Windermere, can't help belonging to them. Now, Lord Darlington, don't stir. I am merely going to finish my flowers. And I must say that I think you are very hard on modern life, Lady Windermere. Of course, there is much against it, I admit. Most women, for instance, nowadays are rather mercenary. Don't talk about such people. Well then, setting aside mercenary people, who, of course, are dreadful, do you think seriously that women who have committed what the world calls a fault should never be forgiven? I think they should never be forgiven. And men. Do you think that there should be the same laws for men as there are for women? Certainly. Well, I think life's too complex a thing to be settled by these hard and fast rules. If we had these hard and fast rules, we should find life much more simple. You allow no exceptions? None. Ah. And what a fascinating Puritan you are, Lady Windermere. The adjective was unnecessary, Lord Darlington. I couldn't help it. I can resist everything except temptation. You have the modern affectation of weakness. It's only an, aff an affectation, Lady Windermere. The Duchess of Berwick and Lady Agatha Carlisle. Oh, dear Margaret, I am so pleased to see you. You remember Agatha, don't you? How do you do, Lord Darlington? I won't let you know, my daughter. You are far too wicked. Oh, don't say that, Duchess. As a wicked man, I am, complete, I am a complete failure. Why, there are lots of people who say that I have never really done anything wrong in this whole course of my life. Of course, they only say it behind my back. <laughs> oh, isn't he dreadful? <laughs> Agatha, this is Lord Darlington. Mind you, dear, don't believe a word he says. <laughs> no, no, no tea, thank you, dear. We have just had tea at Lady Markby's. 
such bad tea, too. It was quite undrinkable. <laughs> I wasn't surprised at all. Her own son-in-law supplies it. Agatha's looking forward so much to her ball tonight, dear Margaret. Oh, you mustn't think it is going to be a ball, Duchess. It is only a dance in honor of my birthday, a very small and early. Very small, very early, and very select, Duchess. Oh, well, of course it's going to be select. We know that, dear Margaret, about your house. <laughs> it really is one of the few houses in London where I can take Agatha and where I feel perfectly secure about dear Berwick. <laughs> I don't know what society is coming to. The most dreadful people seem to go everywhere. Mm -hmm. They certainly come to my parties. Mm -hmm. The men can get quite furious if one doesn't ask them. Really, mm -hmm. someone should make a stand against it. I will, Duchess. I will have no one in my house about whom there is any scandal. Oh, don't say that, Lady Wondermere. I should never be admitted. <laughs> Men don't matter. <laughs> With women, it's different. We're good. Well, some of us are, at least. <laughs> but we are positively getting elbowed into the corner. Mm. Our husbands would really forget our existence if we didn't nag them from time to time, just to remind them that we have a perfect legal right to do so. It's a curious thing, Duchess, about the game of marriage. A game, by the way, that is going out of fashion. The wives hold all the honors and invariably lose the odd trick. The odd trick? Uh, is that the husband, Lord Darlington? It would be rather a good name for the modern husband. Oh, dear D Lord Darlington, how thoroughly depraved you are. Lord Darlington is trivial. Oh, now don't say that, Lady Wondermere. Why do you talk so trivially about life, then? Because I think that life is far too important a thing ever to talk seriously about. So, wh what does he mean? Uh, do, as a concession to my poor wits, Lord Darlington, just explain to me what you really mean. I think I had better not, Duchess. Nowadays, to be intellectual is to be found out. Goodbye. Lady Windermere, goodbye. And I may come tonight, mayn't I? Do let me come. Yes, yes, certainly. But you are not to say foolish, insincere things to people. <laughs> You're beginning to reform me. It is a dangerous thing to reform anyone, Lady Windermere. What a charming, wicked creature. I like him so much. <laughs> I'm quite delighted he's gone. How sweet you're looking. Where do you get your gowns? Oh, and now I must tell you how sorry I am for you, dear Margaret. Agatha, darling. Uh, yes, Mama? Will you go and look over the photograph album I see over there? Dear girl, she's so fond of photographs of Switzerland. <laughs> Such a pure taste, I, I think. <laughs> but I really am so sorry for you, Margaret. Why, Duchess? Oh, on account of that horrid woman. She dresses so well, too, which makes it much worse. Sets a dreadful example. Augustus, you know, my disputable brother, such a trial to us all. Well, Augustus is completely infatuated about her. <laughs> it is quite scandalous, for she is absolutely inadmissible to society. Many a woman has a past, but I am told that she has at least a dozen, <laughs> and that they all fit. Whom are you talking about, Duchess? Well... About Mrs. Erlin. Mrs. Erlin, I never heard of her, Duchess, and what has she to do with me? Oh, oh my poor child. <clears throat> Agatha, darling. Yes, Mama. Will you go out onto the terrace and look at the sunset? 
<laughs> yes, Mama. <laughs> oh, sweet girl. So devoted to sunsets. Shows such refinement of feeling, does it not? Oh, after all, there is nothing like nature is there. But what is it, Duchess? Why do you talk to me about this person? Don't you know, really? I, I assure you, we are oh so distressed about it. Only last night, Lady Jensen, everyone was saying how extraordinary it was that of all the men in London, Windermere should behave in such a way. My husband? What has he got to do with any woman of that kind? Oh, what indeed, dear? I, well, that is the point. He goes to see her continually and stops for hours at a time while, and while he is there, she is not at home to anyone. <laughs> not that many ladies call on her, dear, but she has a great many disreputable men, friends, my own brother particularly, as I told you, and that is what makes it so dreadful about Windermere. I, well, we looked upon him as being such a model husband. But I'm afraid there is no doubt about it. My dear nieces, you know, the Seville girls, don't you? Such nice domestic creatures, plain, dreadfully plain, but so good. <laughs> well, they're always at the window doing fancy work and making ugly things for the poor, <laughs> which I think so useful for them in these dreadful socialistic days. And this terrible woman has taken a house in the Cousin Street right opposite them. Such a respectable street, too. Well, I don't know what we're coming to. No. And they tell me that Windermere goes there four and five times a week. They see him. But they can't help it. And although they never talk scandal, they, well, of course, <laughs> they remark on it to everyone. And worst of all is, and worst of it all, is that I have been told that this woman has got a great deal of money out of somebody, for it seems that she came to London six months ago without anything at all to speak of. And now she has this charming house in Mayfair, drives her ponies in the park every afternoon, and, ah, well, well, since she has known poor dear Windermere. Ah, ah. Oh, I can't believe it. <laughs> oh, but it's quite true, my dear. <laughs> the whole of London knows it. That is why I felt it better to come and talk to you and advise you to take Windermere away at once or to Hamburg or Aix, wherever he'll have some something to amuse him and where you can watch him all day long. <laughs> I assure you, my dear, that on several occasions after I was first married, I had to pretend to be very ill and was obliged to drink the most unpleasant mineral waters merely to get Berwick out of town. <laughs> he was so extremely susceptible, though I am bound to say he never gave away large sums of money to anybody. He is far too principled for that. Duchess, Duchess, it's impossible. We are only married two years. Our child is but six months old. Oh, the dear pretty baby. How is the little darling? Is it a boy or a girl? I hope a girl. Oh, no, I remember it's a boy. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Boys are so wicked. My boy is excessively and excessively immoral. You wouldn't believe at what hours he comes home. And he's only left Oxford a few months. I really don't know what they teach him there. Are all men bad? Oh, all of them, my dear. All of them, without any good exception. And they never grow any better. Men become old, but they never become good. Windermere and I married for love. Oh, yes. We begin like that. It was only 
Bowick's brutal and incessant threats of suicide that made me accept him at all. And before the year was out, he was running after all kinds of petticoats, every color, every shape, every material. <laughs> In fact, before the honeymoon was over, I caught him winking at my maid, <laughs> a most pretty, spectable girl. I dismissed her at once, without a character. No, no, I remember, I remember, I passed her on to my, my sister, yes, oh, poor dear Sir George, so short-sighted. I thought it wouldn't matter, but it did. <laughs> it was most unfortunate. Oh, and now, my dear child, I must go, as we are dining out. And mind you, don't take this little aberration of Windermere's too much to heart. Just take him abroad, and he'll come back to you all right. Come back to me? Oh, yes, dear. These wicked women get husbands away from us. But they always come back. Slightly damaged, of course. Oh, and don't make scenes. Men hate them. It is very kind of you, Duchess, to come and tell me all this. But I can't believe that my husband is untrue to me. Oh, pretty child. I was like that once. Now, I know that all men are monsters. The only thing to do is to feed the wretches well. A cook, a good cook, does wonders. And that I know you have. <laughs> oh, my dear Margaret, no, you're not going to cry, are you? You needn't be afraid, Duchess. I never cry. Oh, that's quite right, dear. Crying is the refuge of plain women, but the ruin of pretty ones. Uh, I have a darling. <laughs> yes, Mama. Come and bid goodbye to Lady Windermere and thank her for your charming visit. <laughs> and by the way, I must thank you for sending a card to Mr. Hopper. He's that rich young Australian people are taking such notice of just at present. His father made a great fortune by selling uh, oh, some kind of food in circular tins. Most palatable, I believe. <laughs> I fancy it is the thing the servants always refuse to eat. <laughs> oh, but the son is quite interesting. I think he's attracted by dear Agatha's clever talk. Of course, we should be very sorry to lose her, but I think that a mother who doesn't part with her daughter every season has no real affection. <laughs> We're coming tonight, dear. And remember my advice, take the poor fellow out of town at once. It is the only thing to do. Oh, goodbye once more. Come, Agatha. Yes, Mama. Oh, how horrible. I understand now what Lord Darlington meant by the imaginary instance of the couple not two years married. Oh, it can't be true. She spoke of enormous sums of money paid to this woman. I know where Arthur keeps his bank book. It is in one of the drawers of that desk. I must find out by that. I will find out. No, oh, it's some hideous mistake. Some silly scandal. He loves me. He loves me, but why should I not look? I am his wife, I have a right to look. I knew it. There's not a word of truth in this stupid story. <laughs> a second book, private, locked. <sighs> Mrs. Erlin. 600 pounds. Mrs. Erlin, 700 pounds. Mrs. Erlin, 400 pounds. Oh, it's true. It is true. Oh, how horrible. Well, dear, has the fan been sent home yet? Margaret, you've cut open my bank book. You have no right to do such a thing. 
you think it was wrong that you were found out, don't you? I think it is wrong that a wife should spy on her husband. I did not spy on you. I never knew of this woman's existence till half an hour ago. Someone who pitied me was kind enough to tell me what everyone in London knows already. Your daily visits to Curzon Street, your mad infatuation, the monstrous sums of money you squander on this infamous woman. Margaret, don't talk like that of Mrs. Erlin. You don't know how unjust it is. You are very jealous of Mrs. Erlin's honor. I wish you had been as jealous of mine. Your honor is untouched, Margaret. You don't think for a moment that I could- I think you spend your money strangely, that is all. Oh, don't imagine I mind about the money. As far as I'm concerned, you may squander everything we have. But what I do mind is that you who have loved me, you who have taught me to love you, should pass from this love that is given to the love that is bought. Oh, it's horrible. And it is I who feel degraded. You don't feel anything. I feel stained, utterly stained. You can't realize how hideous the last six months seem to me now. Oh, every kiss you've given me is tainted in my memory. Don't say that, Margaret. I never loved anyone in the whole world but you. Who is this woman then? Why do you take a house for her? I did not take a house for her. You gave her the money to do it, which is the same thing. Margaret, as far as I have known, Mrs. Erlin... Is there a Mr. Erlin, or is he a myth? Her husband died many years ago. She is alone in the world. No relations? None. Rather curious, isn't it? Margaret, I was saying to you, and I beg you to listen to me, that as far as I have known Mrs. Erlin, she has conducted herself well. If years ago... I don't want details about her life. I am not going to give you any details about her life. I tell you simply this. Mrs. Erlin was once honored, loved, respected. She was well-born. She had position. She lost everything. Threw it away, if you like. That makes it all the more bitter. Uh, misfortunes one can endure. They all they come from the outside, and they are accidents. But to suffer for one's own faults, ah, there is the sting of life. It was twenty years ago, too. She was little more than a girl then. She had been a wife for even less time than you have. I am not interested in her, and you should not mention this woman and me in the same breath. It is an error of taste. Margaret, you could save this woman. She wants to get back into society and she wants you to help her. Me? Yes, you. How impertinent of her. Margaret, I came to ask you a great favor and I still ask it of you, though you have discovered what I intended you should never have known, that I have given Mrs. Erlin a large sum of money. I want you to send her an invitation for our party tonight. You're mad. I entreat you. People may chatter about her, do chatter about her, of course, but they don't know anything definite against her. She has been to several houses, not to houses where you would go, I admit, but still to houses where women who are in what is called society nowadays do go. That does not content her. She wants you to receive her once. As a triumph for her, I suppose? No, but because she knows that you are a good woman and that if she comes here once, she will have a chance of a happier, a, a surer life than she has had. She will make no further effort to know you. Won't you help a woman who is trying to get back? No. If a woman really repents, she never wishes to return to the society that has made her, made or seen her ruin. I beg of you. I'm going to dress for dinner. And don't mention the subject again this evening. Arthur, you fancy because I have no father or mother that I am alone in the world and that you can treat me as you choose? You are wrong. I have friends, many friends. Margaret, you are talking foolishly, recklessly. I won't argue with you. 
but I insist upon your asking Mrs. Erlin tonight. I shall do nothing of the kind. You refuse? Absolutely. Oh, Margaret, do this for my sake. It is her last chance. What has that got to do with me? Oh, how hard good women are. How weak bad men are. Margaret, none of us men may be good enough for the women we marry. This is quite true. But you don't imagine I would ever. Oh, the suggestion is monstrous. Why should you be different from other men? I'm told that there's hardly a husband in London who does not waste his life over some shameful passion. I am not one of them. I'm not sure of that. You are sure, in your heart. But don't make chasm after chasm between us. God knows the last few minutes have thrust us wide enough apart. Sit down and write the card. Nothing in the whole world would induce me. <sighs> then I will. You are going to invite this woman? Yes. Parker. Yes, my lord. Have this note sent to Mrs. Erlin at number 84A Curzon Street. There is no answer. Arthur, if that woman comes here, I shall insult her. Margaret, don't say that. I mean it. Child, if you did such a thing, there is not a woman in London who wouldn't pity you. There is not a good woman in London who would not applaud me. We have been too lax. We must make an example. I propose to begin tonight. You gave me this fan today. It was your birthday present. If that woman crosses my threshold, I shall strike her across the face with it. Margaret, you could do such a thing. You don't know me. Parker. Yes, my lady. I shall dine in my own room. I don't want dinner, in fact. See that everything is ready by half past ten. And Parker, uh, be sure you pronounce the names of the guests very distinctly tonight. And sometimes you speak so fast that I miss them. I'm particularly anxious to hear the names quite clearly so as to make no mistake. You understand, Parker? Yes, my lady. That will do. Arthur, if that woman comes here, I warn you. Margaret, you'll ruin us. Us. From this moment, my life is separate from yours. But if you wish to avoid a public scandal, write at once to this woman and tell her that I Forbid her to come here. I will not. I cannot. She must come. Then I shall do exactly as I have said. You leave me no choice. Ma Ma Margaret! Margaret! <sighs> My God, what shall I do? I dare not tell her who this woman really is. The shame would kill her. Oh, so strange. Lord Windermere isn't here. Mr. Hopper is very late, too. You have kept those five dances for him, haven't you, Agatha? Oh, oh yes, Mama. Well, just let me see your card, dear. Oh, I'm so glad Lady Windermere has revived the cards. They're a mother's only safeguard. <laughs> oh, you dear simple little thing. <laughs> oh, no nice girl should ever waltz with such particularly younger sons. <laughs> it looks too fast. <laughs> Now, these last two dances, you might pass on the terrace with Mr. Harper. Uh, yes, Mama. <laughs> the air is so pleasant there. 
Mrs. Cowper, Cowper, Lady Stutfield, Sir James Royston, Mr. Guy Berkeley. Good evening, Lady Stutfield. I suppose this will be the last ball of the season. <laughs> I suppose so, Mr. Dumby. It's been a delightful season, hasn't it? Quite delightful. <laughs> Good evening, Duchess. I suppose this will be the last ball of the season. Oh, I suppose so, Mr. Dumby. It has been a very dull season, hasn't it? D dreadfully dull, dreadfully dull. Good evening, Mr. Dumby. I suppose this will be the last ball of the season? Oh, I think not. There will probably be two more. Mr. Ruford, Lady Jedberg, and Miss Graham, Mr. Hopper. How do you do, Lady Windermere? How do you do, Duchess? Oh, dear Mr. Hopper, how nice of you to come so early. We all know how you are run after in London. Capital place, London. They're not nearly so exclusive in London as they are in Sydney. Ah, well, we know your value, Mr. Harper. Wish we were, wish, wish there were more like you. <laughs> it would make life so much easier. <laughs> Do you know, Mr. Harper, dear Agatha and I are so much interested in Australia. It must be so pretty with all those dear little kangaroos flying about. <laughs> oh, Agatha has found it on a map. <laughs> what a curious shape it is, just like a large packing case. <laughs> However, it is a very young country, isn't it? Uh, wasn't it made at the same time as the others, Duchess? Oh, how clever you are, Mr. Hopper. <laughs> you have a cleverness quite of your own. Now, I mustn't keep you. But I should like to dance with Lady Agatha, Duchess. Well, I hope she has a dance left. Have you a dance left, Agatha? Mm, yes, Mama. <laughs> the next one? Yes, Mama. <laughs> May I have the pleasure? Mind you. Take great care of my little chatterbox, Mr. Hopper. Margaret, I want to speak to you. In a moment. Lord Augustus Lawton. Good evening, Lady Windermere. So, James, will you take me into the ballroom? Augustus has been dining with us tonight. I really have had quite enough of dear Augustus for the moment. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Bowden, Lord and Lady Paisley, Lord Darlington. I want to speak to you particularly, dear boy. I'm worn to a shadow. Don't, no, I don't look it. None of us men do look what we really are. Damn good thing too. What I want to know is this. Who is she? Where does she come from? Why hasn't she got any dim relations? Dim nuisance relations, but they make one so dim respectable. Are you talking of Mrs. Erlen, I suppose. I only met her six months ago. Till then, I never knew of her existence. <laughs> you have seen a good deal of her since then. Yes, I have seen a good deal of her since then. I have just seen her. Egad, the women are very down on her. I've been dining with Arabella this evening. By Jove, you should have heard what she said about Mrs. Erlen. She didn't leave a rag on her. <laughs> Berwick and I told her that didn't matter much as the lady in question must have an extremely fine figure. You should have seen Arabella's expression. But look here, dear boy, 
I don't know what to do about Mrs. Allen. God, I might be married to her. She treats me with such damn indifference. She's deucing clever, too. She explains everything. Egad, she explains you. She has any amount of explanations for you and all of them different. No explanations are necessary about my friendship with Mrs. Erlen. <laughs> oh, well, look here, dear old fellow. Do you think she will ever get into this dim thing called society? Would you introduce her to your wife? No use beating around the confounded bush. Would you do that? Mrs. Erlen is coming here tonight. Your wife has sent her a card? Mrs. Erlen has received a card. Oh, then she's all right, dear boy. But why didn't you tell me that before? It would have saved me a heap of worry and dim misunderstandings. Mr. Cecil Graham. Good evening, Arthur. Why don't you ask me how I am? I like people to ask me how I am. It shows a widespread interest in my health. Now, tonight, I'm not well. Been dining with my people. Wonder why it's one's own people that are always so tedious. My father would talk morality after dinner. I told him he was old enough to know better. But my experience is that as soon as people are old enough to know better, Oh, they don't know anything at all. Hello, Tuppy! Here you're gonna be married again. I thought you were tired of that game. You're excessively trivial, my dear boy, excessively trivial. Oh, by the way, uh, Tuppy, uh, which is it? Have you been twice married and once divorced? Or twice divorced and once married? <laughs> I say you've been twice divorced and once married. It seems so much more probable. I, I have a very... Bad memory. I, I, I really don't remember which. <laughs> Lord Windermere, I have something most particular to ask you. I'm afraid, if you will excuse me, I must join my wife. Oh, you mustn't dream of such a thing. It's most dangerous nowadays for a husband to pay any attention to his wife in public. It always makes people think that he beats her when they're alone. The world has grown so suspicious of anything that looks like a happy married life. But I'll tell you what it is at supper. Margaret, I must speak to you. Will you hold my fan for me, Lord Darlington? Thanks. Margaret, what you said before dinner was, of course, impossible. That woman is not coming here tonight. Mrs. Erlin is coming here. And if you in any way annoy or wound her, you will bring shame and sorrow on us both. Remember that. Ah, Margaret, only trust me. A wife should trust her husband. London is full of women who trust their husbands. One can always recognize them. They look so thoroughly unhappy. I am not going to be one of them. Lord Darlington, will you give me back my fan, please? Thanks. A useful thing, a fan, isn't it? I want a friend tonight, Lord Darlington. I didn't know I would want one so soon. Lady Wendermere, I knew the time would come someday, but why tonight? I will tell her. I must. It, it would be terrible if there were a scene. Margaret. Mrs. Araline. Uh, you have dropped your fan, Lady Windermere. How do you do again, Lord Windermere? How charming your sweet wife looks. Quite a picture. It was terribly rash of you to come. The wisest thing I ever did in my life. And by the way, you must pay me a good deal of attention this evening. I'm afraid of the women. You must introduce me to some of them. The men I can always manage. How do you do, Lord Augustus? You have quite neglected me lately. I've not seen you since yesterday. I'm afraid you are faithless. Everyone told me so. Now, really, Miss Erlen, allow me to explain. No, dear Lord Augustus, you can't explain anything. It is your chief charm. Ah, if you find charms in me, Mrs. Erlen, 
How pale you are. Cowards are always pale. Well, you look faint. Uh, come out onto the terrace. Yes. Parker, send my cloak out. Lady Windermere, how beautifully your terrace is illuminated. Reminds me of Prince Doria's at Rome. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Graham? Isn't that your aunt, Lady Jedburgh? I should so much like to know her. Oh, certainly, if you wish. Uh, aunt Caroline, allow me to introduce Mrs. Aline? So pleased to meet you, Lady Jedberg. Your nephew and I are great friends. I am so much interested in his political career. I think he's sure to be a wonderful success. He thinks like a Tory and talks like a radical, and that's so important nowadays. He's such a brilliant talker, too. But we all know from whom he inherits that. Lord Allendale was saying to me only yesterday in the park that Mr. Graham talks almost as well as his aunt. Most kind of you to say these charming things to me. Did you introduce Mrs. Erlene to Lady Jedberg? Had to, my dear fellow. I couldn't help it. That woman can make one do anything she wants. How, I don't know. Hope to goodness she won't speak to me. <laughs> On Thursday? What a great pleasure. What a bore it is to have to be civil to these old dowagers, but they always insist on it. What the world is that woman talking to Windermere? Haven't got the slightest idea. Looks like an edition de luxe of a wicked French novel meant specially for the English market. So that is poor Dumby with Lady Plindale. I hear she is frightfully jealous of him. He doesn't seem anxious to speak to me tonight. I suppose he's afraid of her. Those straw-colored women have dreadful tempers. Do you know, I think I'll dance with you first, Windermere. I will make Lord Augustus so jealous. <laughs> Lord Augustus? Lord Windermere insists on my dancing with him first, and as it's his own house, I can't well refuse. You know I would much sooner dance with you. I wish I could think so, Mrs. Erlen. You know it far too well. I can fancy a person dancing through life with you and finding it charming. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You are the most adorable of all ladies. What a nice speech. So simple and so sincere. Just the sort of speech I like. Well, you shall hold my bouquet. Ah, Mr. Dunby, how are you? I am so sorry I have been out the last three times you have called. Come and lunch on Friday. Delighted. I'm so brought you are. I never can believe a word you say. Why did you tell me you didn't know her? What do you mean by calling on her three times running? You, you are not going to go to lunch there. Of course you understand. Uh, my dear Laura, I wouldn't dream of going. You haven't told me her name yet. Who is she? <clears throat> uh, she's a Mrs. <clears throat> Erlen. That woman? Yes, that is what everyone calls her. Oh, very interesting. How oh, intensely interesting. I really must have a good stare at her. I have heard the most shocking things about her. They say she's ruining poor Windermere. And Lady Windermere, who goes in for being so proper, invites her. How extremely amusing. It takes a thoroughly good woman to do a thoroughly stupid thing. You are to lunch there on Friday. Why? Because I want you to take my husband with you. He has been so attentive lately that he has become a perfect nuisance. Now this woman is just the thing for him. He'll dance attendance upon her as long as she lets him and won't bother me. I assure you, women of that kind are most useful. They form the basis of other people's marriages. What a misery you are. I wish you were. <clears throat> I am, to myself. I am the only person in the world I should like to know thoroughly, but I just don't see any chance of it at present.
Yes, her coming here is monstrous, unbearable. I know now what you meant today at tea time. Why didn't you tell me right out? You should have. I couldn't. A man can't tell these things about other men. But if I had known he was going to make you ask her here tonight, I think I would have told you. That insult, at any rate, you should have been spared. I did not ask her. He insisted on her coming, against my entreaties, against my commands. Oh, the house is tainted for me. I feel that every woman here sneers at me as she dances by with my husband. What have I done to deserve this? I gave him all my life. He took it, he used it, spoiled it. I am degraded in my own eyes and I lack courage. I'm a coward. If I know you at all, I know that you can't live with a man who treats you like this. Yet what sort of life would you have, of, have with him? You would feel that he is lying to you every moment of the day. You would feel that the look in his eyes was false, his voice false, his touch false, his passion false. He would come to you when he was weary of others. You would have to comfort him. He would come to you when he was devoted to others. You would have to charm him. You would have to be to him the mask of his real life, the cloak to hide his secret. You're right. You're terribly right. But where am I to turn? You said you would be my friend, Lord Darlington. Tell me what am I to do? Be my friend now. Between men and women, there is no friendship possible. There is passion, enmity, Worship, love, but no friendship. I love you. No, no. Yes, I love you. You are more to me than anything in the whole world. What does your husband give you? Nothing. Whatever is in him, he gives to this wretched woman whom he has thrust into your society, into your home, to shame you before everyone. I offer you my life. Lord Darlington. My life, my whole life. Take it and do what you will. I love you. Love you as I've never loved any living thing. From the moment I met you, I loved you. Loved you blindly, adoringly, madly. You did not know it then. You know it now. Leave this house tonight. I won't tell you that the world matters nothing or the world's voice or the voice of society. They, they matter a great deal. They matter far too much. But there are moments when one has to choose between living one's own life fully, entirely, completely, or dragging out some false, shallow, degrading existence that the world is in its hypocrisy demands. You have that moment now. Choose. Oh, my love, choose. I have not the courage. Yes, you have the courage. There may be six months of pain, of disgrace even, but when you no longer bear his name, when you bear mine, all will be well. I longer at my love, my wife that shall be someday. Yes, my wife. You know it. What are you now? This woman has the place that belongs by right to you. Oh, go. Go out of this house with head erect, with smile upon your lips, with courage in your eyes. Oh, London will know why you did it. And who will blame you? No one. If they do what matter, wrong? What is wrong? It's wrong for a man to abandon his wife for a shameless woman. It is wrong for a wife to remain with a man who so dishonors her. You said once, 
you would make no compromise with things. Make none now. Be brave. Be yourself. I'm afraid of being myself. Let me think. Let me wait. My, my husband may return to me. And you would take him back. You are not what I thought you were. You are just the same as every other woman. You would stand anything rather than face the censure of the world, whose praise you would despise. In a week, you will be driving with this woman in the park. She will be your constant guest, your dearest friend. You would endure anything rather than break with one blow this monstrous tie. You are right. You have no courage. None. Ha ha, give me time to think. I cannot answer you now. It must be now or not at all. Then not at all. You break my heart. Mine is already broken. Tomorrow I leave England. This is the last time I shall ever look on you. You will never see me again. For one moment, our lives met, our souls touched. They must never meet or touch again. Goodbye, Margaret. How alone I am in life. Oh, how terribly alone. Oh, dear Margaret, I have just been having such a delightful chat with Mrs. Olin. Oh, I am so sorry for what I said to you this afternoon about her. Of course, she must be all right if you invite her. A most attractive woman and has such sensible views on life told me she entirely disapproved of people marrying more than once, so I feel quite safe about poor Augustus. <laughs> Can't imagine why people speak against her. It's those horrid nieces of mine, the Seville girls. They're always talking scandal. Still, I should go to Hamburg, dear. I really should. She is just a little too attractive. <laughs> Oh, but, but where is Agatha? Oh, oh, there she is. <laughs> Mr. Hopper? Mr. Hopper, I am very, very angry with you. You have taken Agatha out on the terrace, and she is so delicate. Oh, awfully sorry, Duchess. I went out for a moment, then got Ooh. chatting together. <laughs> About dear Australia, I suppose. Yes. Uh, Agatha, darling. Yes, Mama. <laughs> Did Mr. Hopper definitely? Oh, yes, Mama. <laughs> what answer did you give him, dear child? Yes, Mama. <gasps> Oh, my dear one, you always say the right thing. <laughs> Mr. Harper, uh, James, Agatha has told me everything. How cleverly you have both kept your secret. <laughs> Don't mind my taking Agatha off to Australia then, Duchess. <laughs> to Australia? <laughs> Don't mention that dreadful place. But she said she'd like to come with me. Did you say that, Agatha? Yes, Mama. Oh, <laughs> Agatha, you say the most silly things possible. I think on the whole that Grosvenor Square would be a more healthy place to reside in. There are lots of vulgar people in lo living in Grosvenor Square, but at any rate, there are no horrid kangaroos crawling about. Oh, but we'll talk about tomorrow. <laughs> James, you can take Agatha down. You'll come to lunch, lunch, of course, James. At half past one instead of two, the Duke will wish to say a few words to you, I am sure. 
I should like to have a chat with the Duke, Duchess. He has not said a single word to me yet. I think you will find he will have a great deal to say to you tomorrow. <laughs> and now, good night, Margaret. I'm afraid it's the old, old story, dear. Love, well, not love at first sight, but love at the end of the season, which is so much more satisfactory. Good night, Duchess. My dear Margaret, what a handsome woman your husband has been dancing with. I should be quite jealous if I were you. Is she a great friend of yours? No. Really? Good night, dear. An awful manners young Hopper has. Ah! Hopper's one of nature's gentlemen. The worst kind of gentleman I know. Sensible woman, Lady Windermere. Lots of wives would have objected to Mrs. Erden coming. But Lady Windermere has that uncommon thing called common sense. And Windermere knows that nothing looks li so like innocence as indiscretion. <laughs> yes. Dear Windermere is becoming almost modern. <laughs> Never thought he would. Good night, Lady Windermere. What a fascinating woman Mrs. Erlin is. She's coming to lunch on Thursday. Won't you come too? I expect the bishop and dear Mrs. Merton. I am afraid I am engaged, Lady Jedburgh. So sorry, dear. Come, dear. Charming ball it has been. Quite reminds me of old days. And I see that there are just as many fools in society as there used to be. So pleased to find that nothing has altered. <laughs> Except Margaret. She's grown quite pretty. The last time I saw her, 20 years ago, she was a fright in flannel. Positive fright, I assure you. The dear Duchess, and that sweet Lady Agatha, just the type of girl I like. Well, really, Windermere, if I am to be the Duchess' sister-in-law... But are you? Oh, yes. He's to call tomorrow at 12 o'clock. He wanted to propose tonight. In fact, he did. He kept on proposing. Poor Augustus, you know how he repeats himself. Such a bad habit. But I told him I wouldn't give him an answer till tomorrow. Of course I'm going to take him, and I dare say I'll make him an admirable wife, as wives go. And there is a great deal of good in Lord Augustus. Fortunately, it is all on the surface, just where good qualities should be. Of course, you must help me in this matter. I am not called on to encourage Lord Augustus, I suppose. Oh, no, I do the encouraging. But you will make me a handsome settlement, Windermere, won't you? Is that what you want to talk to me about tonight? Yes. I will not talk of it here. Then we will talk of it on the terrace. Even business should have a picturesque background. Should it not, Windermere? With a proper background, women can do anything. Won't tomorrow do as well? No. You see, tomorrow I'm going to accept him. And I think it would be a good thing if I was able to tell him that I had, well, what shall I say, two thousand pounds a year left to me by a third cousin, or a second husband, or some distant relative of that kind? It would be an additional attraction, wouldn't it? You have a delightful opportunity now of paying me a compliment, Windermere. But you are not very clever at paying compliments. I'm afraid Margaret does encourage you in that excellent habit. It's a great mistake on her part. When men give up saying all that is charming, they give up thinking what is charming. But seriously, what do you say to 2,000 pounds? 2,500 pounds, I think. In modern life, margin is everything. Windermere, don't you think the world an immensely amusing place? I do. To stay in this house any longer is impossible. Tonight, a man who loves me offered me his whole life I refused it. It was foolish of me. I will offer him mine now. I will give him mine. I will go to him. Arthur has never understood me. When he reads this, 
he will. He may do as he chooses now with his life. I have done with mine as I think best, as I think right. It is he who has broken the bond of marriage, not I. I only break its bondage. Is Lady Windermere in the ballroom? Her ladyship has just gone out. Gone out? She's not on the terrace? No, madam. Her ladyship has just gone out of the house. Out of the house? Yes, madam. Her ladyship told me she had left a letter for his lordship on the table. A letter for Lord Windermere? Yes, madam. Thank you. Gone out of her house. Let her address to her husband. No, no, it, it would be impossible. Life does repeat its tragedies like that. Why does this horrible fancy come across me? Why do I remember now the one moment of my life I most wish to forget? Does life repeat its tragedies? Oh, how terrible. The same words that 20 years ago I wrote to her father. How bitterly I've been punished for it. No, my punishment, my real punishment is tonight, is now. Have you said goodnight to my wife? Uh, yes. Where is she? She's very tired. She has gone to bed. She said she had a headache. Well, I must go to her. You'll excuse me. Oh, no, it's nothing serious. She's only very tired, that is all. Besides, there are people still in the supper room. She wants you to make her apologies to them. She said she didn't wish to be disturbed. She asked me to tell you. Uh, you have dropped something. Oh, yes, thank you. That is mine. But it is my wife's handwriting, isn't it? Yes, it's an address. Will you ask them to call my carriage, please? Certainly. Thanks. <laughs> what can I do? What can I do? I feel a passion awakening in me that I never felt before. What can it mean? The daughter must not be like the mother. That would be terrible. How can I save her? How can I save my child? A moment may ruin a life. Who knows that better than I? Windermere must be got out of the house. That is absolutely necessary. But how shall I do it? It must be done somehow. Ah! Dear lady, I am in such suspense. May I not have an answer to my request? Lord Augustus, listen to me. You are to take Lord Windermere down to your club at once and keep him there as long as possible. You understand? But you said you wish me to keep early hours. Do what I tell you. Do what I tell you. And my reward? Your reward? Your reward. Oh, ask me that tomorrow. But don't let Windermere out of your sight tonight. If you do, I will never forgive you. I will never speak to you again. I'll have nothing to do with you. Remember, you are to keep Windermere at your club and don't let him come back tonight. Well, really? I might be your husband already. Positively, I might. Why doesn't he come? This waiting is horrible. He should be here. Why is he not here to wait by passionate words for some fire within me? I'm cold, cold as a loveless thing. Arthur must have read my letter by this time. If he cared for me, he would have come after me, would have taken me back by force. But he doesn't care. He's entrammeled by this woman, fascinated by her, dominated by her. If a woman wants to hold a man, she has merely to appeal to what is worst in him. We make gods of men, and they leave us. 
Others make brutes of them and they fawn and are faithful. How hideous life is. Oh, it was mad of me to come here, horribly mad. And yet, which is the worst, I wonder, to be at the mercy of a man who loves me or the wife of a man who in one's own house dishonors me? What woman knows, what woman in the whole world? But will he love me always, this man to whom I am giving my life? What do I bring him? Lips that have lost the note of joy, eyes that are blinded by tears, chill hands, and icy heart. I bring him nothing. I must go back. No, I can't go back. My letter has put me in their power. Arthur would not take me back. Oh, that fatal letter. No. Oh, Lord Darlington leaves England tomorrow. I will go with him. I have no choice. No, no, I will go back. Let Arthur do with me what he pleases. I can't wait here. Oh, it has been madness, my coming. I must go at once. As for Lord Darlington, oh, oh, here he is. Oh, what shall I do? What, shall, what can I say to him? Will you let me go away at all? I've heard that men are brutal, horrible. Oh. Lady Windermere, thank heaven I'm in time. You must go back to your husband's house immediately. Must? Yes, you must. There is not a moment to lose. Sorry, I lost my place. Okay, sorry. Starting over. Yes, you must. There is not a second to be lost. Lord Darlington may return at any moment. Don't come near me. Oh, you are on the brink of ruin. You are on the brink of a hideous precipice. You must leave this place at once. My carriage is waiting at the corner of the street. You must come with me and drive straight home. What are you doing? Mrs. Erland, if you had not come here, I would have gone back. But now that I see you, I feel that nothing in the whole world would induce me to live under the same roof as Lord Windermere. You fill me with horror. There is something about you that stirs the wildest rage within me. And I know why you are here. My husband sent you to lure me back that I might serve as a blind to whatever relations exist between you and him. Oh, you can't think that, you can't. Go back to my husband, Mrs. Erlin. He belongs to you and not to me. I suppose he is afraid of a scandal. Men are such cowards. They outrage every law of the world and are afraid of the world's tongue. But he had better prepare himself. He shall have a scandal. He shall have the worst scandal there has been in London for years. He shall see his name in every vile paper on every hideous placard. No, no. Yes, he shall. Had he come himself, I admit, I would have gone back to the life of degradation you and he had prepared for me. I was going back. But to stay himself at home and to send you as his messenger. Oh, it was infamous, infamous. Lady Windermere, you wrong me horribly. You wrong your husband horribly. He doesn't know you are here. He thinks you are safe in your own house. He thinks you're asleep in your own room. He never read the mad letter you wrote to him. Never read it? No, he knows nothing about it. How simple you think me. You are lying to me. I am not. I am telling you the truth. If my husband didn't read my letter, how is it that you are here? Who told you I had left the house you were shameless enough to enter? Who told you where I had gone to? My husband told you and sent you to decoy me back. Your husband has never seen the letter. I saw it. I opened it. I read it. You opened a letter of mine to my husband? You wouldn't dare. Dare? Oh, to save you from the abyss? into which you are falling there's nothing in the world i would not dare nothing in the whole world here 
is the letter. Your husband has never read it. He shall never read it. It should never have been written. How do I know that that was my letter after all? You seem to think the commonest device can take me in. Oh, why do you disbelieve everything I tell you? What object do you think I have in coming here except to save you from utter ruin, to save you from the consequence of a hideous mistake? That letter that is burnt now was your letter. I swear it to you. You took good care to burn it before I had examined it. I cannot trust you, you whose whole life is a lie. Could you speak the truth about anything? Think as you like about me. Say what you choose against me, but go back. Go back to the husband you love. I do not love him. You do, and you know that he loves you. He does not understand what love is. He understands it as little as you do. But I see what you want. It would be a great advantage for you to get me back. Dear heaven, what a life I would have then, living at the mercy of a woman who has neither mercy nor pity in her, a woman whom it is an infamy to meet, a degradation to know, a vile woman, a woman who comes between a husband and a wife. Lady Windermere, Lady Windermere, don't say such terrible things. You don't know how terrible they are, how terrible and how unjust. Listen, you must listen. Only go back to your husband and I promise you never to communicate with him again on any pretext. Never to see him, never to have anything to do with his life or yours. The money that he gave me, he gave me not through love, but through hatred. Not in worship, but in contempt. The hold I have over him. Ah, you admit you have a hold. Yes, and I will tell you what it is. It is his love for you, Lady Windermere. You expect me to believe that? You must believe it. It is true. It is his love for you that has made him submit to, oh, call it what you like, tyranny, threats, anything you choose, but it is his love for you, his desire to spare you shame. Yes, shame and disgrace. What do you mean? You are insolent. What have I to do with you? Nothing. I know it. But I tell you that your husband loves you, that you may never meet with such love again in your whole life and that such love you will never meet, and that if you throw it away, the day may come when you will starve for love and it will not be given to you. Beg for love and it will be denied you. Oh, Arthur loves you. Arthur, and you tell me there is nothing between you? Lady Windermere, before heaven, your husband is guiltless of all offense towards you, and I... I tell you that had it ever occurred to me that such a monstrous suspicion would have entered your mind, I would have died rather than cross your life or his. Oh, died, gladly died. You talk as if you had a heart. Women like you have no hearts. Heart is not in you. You are bought and sold. Believe what you choose about me. I am not worth a moment's sorrow. But don't spoil your beautiful life on my account. You don't know what may be in store for you unless you leave this house at once. You don't know what it is to fall into the pit, to be despised, mocked, abandoned, sneered at, to be an outcast, to find the door shut against one, to have to creep in by hideous byways, afraid every moment lest the mask should be stripped from one's face, and all the while to hear the laughter, horrible laughter of the world, a thing more tragic than all the tears the world has ever shed. You don't know what it is. One pays for one's sins, and then one pays again, and all one's life one pays. 
you must never know that. As for me, if suffering be an expiation, then at this moment I have expiated all my faults, whatever they have been, for tonight you have made a heart in one who had it not, made it and broken it. But let that pass. I may have wrecked my own life, but I will not let you wreck yours. You, why you are a mere girl, you would be lost. You haven't got the kind of brains that enables a woman to get back. You have neither the wit nor the courage. You couldn't stand dishonor, no. Go back, Lady Windermere, to the husband who loves you, whom you love. You have a child, Lady Windermere. Go back to that child who even now in pain or in joy may be calling to you. God gave you that child. He will require from you that you make his life fine, that you watch over him. What answer will you make to God if his life is ruined through you? Back to your house, Lady Windermere. Your husband loves you. He has never swerved from, for a moment from the love he bears you. But even if he had a thousand loves, you must stay with your child. If he was harsh to you, you must stay with your child. If he ill-treated you, you must stay with your child. If he abandoned you, your place is with your child. Lady Windermere. Take me home. Take me home. Come. Where is your cloak? Here, put it on. Come at once. Stop. Don't you hear voices? No. No, there was no one. Yes, there is. Listen. Oh, that's my husband's voice. He's coming in. Oh, save me. It's some plot you have sent for him. Silence. I'm here to save you if I can, but I fear it is too late. There. The first chance you have, slip out, if you ever get a chance. But you? Oh, never mind me. I'll face them. Nonsense, dear Windermere. You must not leave me. Lord Augustus, then it is I who am lost. What a nuisance they're turning us out of the club at this hour. It's only two o'clock. The lively part of the evening is only just beginning. It's very good of you, Lord Darlington, allowing Augustus to force our company on you, but I'm afraid I can't stay long. Really? Well, I'm so sorry. You'll take a cigar, won't you? Thanks. My dear boy, you must not dream of going. I have a great deal to talk to you about, of damned importance, too. Oh, and we all know what it is. Tuppy can't talk about anything but Mrs. Aline. Well, that is no business of yours, is it, Cecil? None, and that's why it interests me. My own business always bores me to death. I prefer other people's. Have something to drink, you fellas. Cecil, you'll have a whiskey and soda. Thanks. Mrs. Aline looked very handsome tonight, didn't she? Uh, I am not one of her admirers. But you seem to be. Uh, but I am now. Why, she actually made me introduce her to poor dear Aunt Caroline. I believe she's going to lunch there. No. But she is, really. Well, excuse me, you fellows. I'm a... Uh... Going away tomorrow. I have to write a few letters. Hmm. Clever woman, Mrs. Erlin. <laughs> Hello, Dumby. I thought you were asleep. I am. I usually am. <laughs> a very clever woman. Knows perfectly well what a damn fool I am. Knows it as well as I do myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you may laugh, my boy. 
but it is a great thing to come across a woman who thoroughly understands one. <laughs> it is an awfully dangerous thing. But I, I thought, by marrying one. I thought, Tappy, you were never going to see her again. Yes, you told me so yesterday evening at the club. You said that you had heard. Oh, <laughs> she explained that. And the Wisbedon affair? She explained that, too. Oh. And her income, Tuppy, has she explained that? <laughs> She's going to explain that tomorrow. <laughs> Awfully <laughs> commercial women nowadays. Our grandmothers threw their caps over the mills, of course, but by Jove, their granddaughters only throw their caps over the mills. They can raise the wind for them. Mm -hmm. You want to make her out a wicked woman? She is not. Oh, wicked women bother one. Good women bore one. That's the only real difference between them. Mrs. Erlen has a future before her. <laughs> Mrs. Erlen has a past before her. <laughs> I prefer women with a past. They're always so damn amusing to talk to. Well, you'll have lots of topics of conversation with her, Tuffy. <laughs> You're getting annoying, dear boy. You're getting damned annoying. Oh, now, Tuppy, you've lost your figure, and you've lost your character. Don't lose your temper. You've only got one. My dear boy, if I wasn't the most good-natured man in all of London... We'd treat you with more respect, wouldn't we, Tuppy? <laughs> the youth of the present day are quite monstrous. <laughs> they have absolutely no respect for dyed hair. Oh, Mrs. Erline has a very great respect for dear Tuppy. Oh, then Mrs. Erline sets an admirable <laughs> example to the rest of her sex. It's perfectly brutal the way most women nowadays behave to men who are not their husbands. Gumby, you are ridiculous. And Cecil, you let your tongue run away with you. You must leave Mrs. Erlane alone. Mm. You don't really know anything about her, and you're always talking scandal against her. <gasps> My dear Arthur, I never talk scandal. I only talk gossip. <laughs> what is the difference between scandal and gossip? Oh, gossip is charming. History is merely gossip. But scandal is gossip made tedious by morality. Now, I never moralize. A man who moralizes is usually a hypocrite. But a woman who moralizes is invariably plain. There's nothing in the whole world so unbecoming to a woman as a nonconformist conscience. And most women know it, I'm glad to say. Just my sentiments, dear boy, just my sentiments. Oh, sorry to hear it, Tuppy. Whenever people agree with me, I always feel I must be wrong. My dear boy, when I was your age. But you never were, Tuppy. <laughs> And you never will be. I say, Darlington, let's have some cards. You play, Arthur, won't you? No, thanks, Cecil. Mm. Good heavens, how marriage ruins a man. It's as demoralizing as cigarettes and far more expensive. You'll play, of course, Tuppy. Can't, dear boy. Promise Mrs. Erlen never to play or drink again. <laughs> now, my dear Tuppy, don't be led astray into paths of virtue. Reformed, you would be perfectly tedious. That is the worst of women. They always want one to be good. And if we're good, when they meet us, they don't love us at all. They like, uh, they like to find us quite irretrievably bad and to leave us quite unattractively good. They always do find us bad. <laughs> I don't think we're bad. I think we're all good, mm. except Tuppy. <laughs> <laughs> we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. We are mm. all in the gutter, but some of us looking at stars. Upon my word, you have a very romantic tonight, Darlington. Too romantic. You must be in love. Who's the girl? The woman I love is not free, or thinks she isn't. A married woman then. Well, there's nothing in the world like the devotion of a married woman. It's a thing no married man knows anything about. Oh, she doesn't love me. She is a good woman. 
She is the only good woman I have ever met in my life. The only good woman you've ever met in your life? Yes. <laughs> well, you are a lucky fellow. Well, I've met hundreds of good women. I never seem to meet any but good women. The world is perfectly packed with good women. To know them is to, that to know them is a middle class education. This woman has purity and innocence. <clears throat> she has everything we men have lost. My dear fellow, what on earth should we men do going about with purity and innocence? A carefully thought out buttonhole is much more effective. Uh, she doesn't really love you then. No, she does not. <laughs> well, I congratulate you, my dear fellow. In this world, there are only two tragedies. One is not getting what one wants and the other is getting it. Ah. The last is so much the worst. The last is a real tragedy. <laughs> but I am interested to hear how she does not love you. How long could you love a woman who didn't love you, Cecil? A woman who didn't love me? All my life. <laughs> so could I, but it's so difficult to meet one. How could you be so conceited, Dumby? I don't say it as a matter of conceit. I say it as a matter of regret. Oh. I have been wildly, madly adored. <laughs> I am sorry I have. It has been an immense nuisance. I should like to be allowed a little time to myself now and then. <laughs> time to educate yourself, I suppose. No, time to forget all I've learned. <laughs> that is much more important, dear Tuppy. <laughs> What cynics you fellows are. What's a cynic? A man who knows the price of everything and has the value of nothing. Ah, and a sentimentalist, my dear Darlington, is a man who sees the absurd value in everything and doesn't know the market price of a single thing. You always amuse me, Cecil. You talk as if you are a man of experience. I am. You are far too young. Ah, that is a great error. Experience is a question of instinct about life. I've got it. Tuppy hasn't. <laughs> Experience is the name Tuppy gives to his mistakes, that's all. Oh. Experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes. Ah, one shouldn't commit any. Life would be very dull without them. Of course, you're quite faithful to this woman you're in love with, Darlington. To this good woman. Cecil, if one really loves a woman, all other women in the world become absolutely meaningless to one. Yeah. Love changes one. And I am changed. Oh, dear me. How very interesting. Tuppy, I want to talk to you. It's no use talking to Tuppy. You might as well talk to a brick wall. Oh, but I like talking to a brick wall. It's the only thing in the world that never contradicts me. Tuppy. Well, what is it? What is it? Come over here. I want you particularly. Darlington has been moralizing and talking about the purity of love and that sort of thing and he has got some woman in his room all the time. No, really? Really? Yes, he has a fan. By Jove, <laughs> by Jove! I really, I am really off now, Lord Darlington. I'm sorry you are leaving England so soon. Uh, pray, call on us when you come back. My wife and I will be charmed to see you. I'm afraid I shall be away for many years. Good night. Arthur! What? <laughs> I want to speak to you a moment. No, 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 do come. I can't, I'm off. It's something very particular. It'll interest you enormously. It is some of your nonsense, Cecil. It isn't. It isn't really. My dear fellow, you mustn't go yet. I have a lot to talk to you about. 
and Cecil has something to show you. <laughs> well, what is it? Darlington has got a woman here in his rooms. Here's her fan. Amusing, isn't it? Good God. What's the matter? Lord Darlington. Yes? What is my wife's fan doing here in your rooms? Ooh. Hands off, Cecil, don't touch me. <laughs> your wife's fan? Ooh. Yes, here it is. I don't know. Well, you must know. <laughs> I demand an explanation. Oh. Don't, don't hold me, you fools. <laughs> she is here after all. Sir, speak, sir. Why is my wife's fan here? Answer me. By God, I will search your rooms. And if my wife's here, I'll... <clears throat> you shall not search my rooms. You have no right to do so, and I forbid you. You scoundrel. I'll not leave your room until I've searched every corner of it. What moves behind that curtain? Lord Windermere. <gasps> Mrs. Erlin. I'm afraid I took your wife's fan in mistake for my own when I was leaving your house tonight. I am so sorry. How can I tell him? I can't tell him. It would kill me. I wonder what happened after I escaped from that horrible room. Perhaps she told them the reason, the true reason of her being there and the real meaning of that fatal fan of mine. Oh, if he knows. How can I look him in the face again? He would never forgive me. How securely one thinks one lives out of reach of temptation, sin, folly, and then suddenly, oh, life is terrible. It rules us, we do not rule it. Did your ladyship ring for me? Yes. Have you found out at what time Lord Windermere came in last night? His lordship did not come until five o'clock. Five o'clock? He knocked at my door this morning, didn't he? Yes, my lady. At half past nine. I told him your ladyship was not awake yet. Did he say anything? Something about your ladyship's fan. I didn't quite catch what his lordship said. Has the fan been lost, my lady? I can't find it. And Parker says it was not left in any of the rooms. He has looked in all of them and on the terrace as well. Doesn't matter. Tell Parker not to trouble, that will do. She's sure to tell him. I can fancy a person doing a wonderful act of self-sacrifice, doing it spontaneously, recklessly, nobly, and afterwards finding out that it costs too much. Why should she hesitate between her ruin and mine? How strange. I would have publicly disgraced her in my own house. She accepts public disgrace in the house of another to save me. There's a bitter irony in things. A bitter irony in the way we talk of good and bad women. Oh, what a lesson. And what a pity that in life we only get our lessons when they are of no use to us. For even if she doesn't tell, I must. The shame of it. The shame of it. To tell it is to live through it all again. Actions are the first tragedy in life. Words are the second. Words are perhaps the worst. Words are merciless. Oh. Margaret, how pale you look. I slept very badly. I'm so sorry. I came in dreadfully late and didn't like to wake you. You're crying, my dear. Yes, I'm crying. For I have something to tell you, Arthur. Oh, my dear child, you are not well. You've been doing too much. Let us go away to the country. You'll be all right at Selby. The season is almost over. There's no use staying on. Oh, poor darling. We'll go away today, if you like. We can easily catch the 340. I'll send wire to Fannin. 
Yes. Let us go away today. No, I can't go today, Arthur. There's someone I must see before I leave town. I, someone who has been kind to me. Kind to you? Far more than that. I will tell you, Arthur. But only love me. Love me as you used to love me. Used to? You, you're not thinking of that wretched woman who came here last night. You, you still... You don't still imagine... No, you couldn't. I don't. I know now I was wrong and foolish. It was very good of you to receive her last night. But you are to never see her again. Why do you say that? <sighs> Margaret, I thought Mrs. Erlian was a woman more sinned against than sinning, as the phrase goes. I thought she wanted to be good, to get back into a place that she had lost by a moment's folly to lead again a good, decent life. I believed what she told me. I was mistaken in her. She is bad, as bad as a woman can be. Arthur, Arthur, don't talk so bitterly about any woman. I don't think now that people can be divided into the good and the bad as though they were two separate races or creations. <laughs> what, but... what are called good women may have terrible things in them. Mad moods of recklessness, assertion, jealousy, sin. Bad women, as they are termed, may have in them sorrow, repentance, pity, sacrifice. And I don't think Mrs. Erlin is a bad woman. I know she's not. My dear child, the woman's impossible. No matter what harm she tries to do us, you must never see her again. She is inadmissible anywhere. But I want to see her. I want her to come here. Never. She came here once as your guest. She must come now as mine. That is but fair. No, she should never have come here. It is too late, Arthur, to say that now. <laughs> Margaret, no, if you knew where Mrs. Erlin went last night after she left this house, you would not sit in the same room with her. It was absolutely shameless, the whole thing. Arthur, I can't bear it any longer. I must tell you. Last night, we... Mrs. Erlen has called to return your ladyship's fan, which she took away by mistake last night. Mrs. Erlen has written a message on the card. Oh, ask Mrs. Erlen to be kind enough to come up. Say I shall be very glad to see her. She wants to see me, Arthur. Margaret, I beg you not to. Let me see her first at any rate. She's a very dangerous woman. She's the most dangerous woman I know. You don't realize what you're doing. It is right that I should see her. Oh, my child, you may be on the brink of a great sorrow. Don't go to meet her. It's absolutely necessary that I should see her before you do. Why should it be necessary? Mrs. Erlin. How do you do, Lady Windermere? How do you do? Do you know, Lady Windermere, I am so sorry about your fan. I can't imagine how I made such a silly mistake. Most stupid of me. And as I was driving in your direction, I thought I would take the opportunity of returning your property in person with many apologies for my carelessness and of bidding you goodbye. Goodbye? Are you going away then, Mrs. Erlin? Yes, I am going to live abroad again. The English climate doesn't suit me. My heart is affected here, and I don't like it. I prefer living in the South. London is too full of fogs and, and serious people, Lord Windermere. Whether the fogs produce the serious people or whether the serious people produce the fogs, I don't know. But the whole thing rather gets on my nerves, and so I'm leaving this afternoon by the club train. This afternoon? But I wanted so much to come and see you. How kind of you, but I am afraid I have to go. Shall I never see you again, Mrs. Erlin? I'm afraid not. Our lives lie too far apart. But there is a little thing I would like you to do for me. I want a photograph of you, Lady Windermere. 
Would you give me one? You don't know how gratified I should be. Oh, with pleasure. There is one on that table. I'll show it to you. It is monstrous you're intruding yourself here after your conduct last night. My dear Windermere, manners before morals. I'm afraid it is very flattering. I'm not so pretty as that. You are much prettier. But haven't you got one of yourself with your little boy? Oh, I have. Would you prefer one of those? Yes. I'll go get it for you. If you'll excuse me for a moment, I have one upstairs. So sorry, Lady Windermere, to give you so much trouble. No trouble at all, Mrs. Erlin. <laughs> Thanks so much. You seem rather out of temper this morning, Windermere. Why should you be? Margaret and I are on charming, get on charmingly together. I can't bear to see you with her. Besides, you have not told me the truth, Mrs. Erlin. I have not told her the truth, you mean. Sometimes I wish you had. I should have been spared then the misery, the anxiety, the annoyance of the last six months. But rather than my wife should know that the mother whom she was taught to consider as dead, the mother whom she had mourned as dead, is living. A divorced woman, going about under an assumed name, a bad woman, preying upon life as I know you now to be. Rather than that, I was ready to supply you with money to pay bill after bill, extravagance after extravagance, to risk what occurred yesterday, the first quarrel I have ever had with my wife. You don't understand what that means to me. How could you? But I tell you, the only bitter words that ever came from those sweet lips of hers were on your account, and I hate to see you next to her. You sully the innocence that is in her. And then I used to think that with all your faults, you were frank and honest. You are not. Why do you say that? You made me get you an invitation to my wife's ball. For my daughter's ball, yes. You came, and within an hour of your leaving the house, you are found in a man's rooms. You were disgraced before everyone. Yes. Therefore, I have a right to look upon you as what you are, a worthless, vicious woman. I have the right to tell you never to enter this house, never to attempt to come near my wife. My daughter, you mean. You have no right to claim her as a daughter. You left her, abandoned her when she was but a child in the cradle, abandoned her for your lover who abandoned you in turn. Do you count that to his credit, Lord Windermere, or to mine? To his now that I know you. Take care. You had better be careful. Oh, I am not going to mince words for you. I know you thoroughly. I question that. I do know you. For twenty years of your life, you lived without your child, without a thought of your child. One day you read in the papers that she had married a rich man. You saw your hideous chance. You knew that to spare her the ignominy of learning that a woman like you was her mother, I would endure anything. You began your blackmailing. Don't use ugly words, Windermere. They are vulgar. I saw my chance, it is true, and took it. Yes, you took it, and spoiled it all last night by being found out. You are quite right. I spoiled it all last night. And as for your blunder in taking my wife's fan from here and then leaving it about in Darlington's rooms, it is unpardonable. I can't bear the sight of it now. I shall never let my wife use it again. The thing is soiled for me. You should have kept it and not brought it back. I think I shall keep it. It's extremely pretty. I shall ask Margaret to give it to me. I hope my wife will give it to you. Oh, I'm sure she will have no objection. I wish that at the same time she would give you a miniature she kisses every night before she prays. It's the miniature of a young, innocent-looking girl with beautiful, dark hair. Ah, yes, I remember. How long ago that seems. It was done before I was married. Dark hair and an innocent expression with a fashion then, Windermere. What do you mean by coming here this morning? What is your object? To bid goodbye to my dear daughter, of course. Oh, don't imagine I'm going to have a pathetic scene with her, weep on her neck and tell her who I am and all that kind of thing. I have no ambition to play the part of a mother. 
Only once in my life have I known a mother's feelings. That was last night. They were terrible. They made me suffer. They made me suffer too much. For 20 years, as you say, I lived childless. And I want to live childless still. Besides, my dear Windermere, how on earth could I pose as a mother with a grown-up daughter? Margaret is 21, and I have never admitted that I am more than 29, or 30 at most. 29 when there are pink shades, 30 when there are not. So you see what difficulties it would involve. No. As far as I'm concerned, let your wife cherish the memory of this dead, stainless mother. Why should I interfere with her illusions? I find it hard enough to keep my own. I lost one illusion last night. I thought I had no heart. I find I have. And a heart doesn't suit me, Windermere. Somehow it doesn't go with modern dress. It makes one look old. And it spoils one's career at critical moments. You fill me with horror. With absolute horror. I suppose, Windermere, you would like me to retire into a convent or become a hospital nurse or something of that kind, as people do in silly modern novels. That is stupid of you, Arthur. In real life, we don't do such things. Not as long as we have any good looks left, at any rate. No, what consoles one nowadays is not repentance, but pleasure. Repentance is quite out of date. And besides, if a woman really repents, she has to go to a bad dressmaker, otherwise no one believes in her. And nothing in the world would induce me to do that. No, I'm going to pass entirely out of your two lives. My coming into them has been a mistake. I discovered that last night. A fatal mistake. Almost fatal. I'm sorry now I did not tell my wife the whole thing at once. I regret my bad actions. You regret your good ones. That is the difference between us. I don't trust you. I will tell my wife. It's better for her to know and from me. It will cause her infinite pain. It will humiliate her terribly, but it's right that she should know. You propose to tell her? I'm going to tell her. If you do, I will make my name so infamous that it will mar every moment of her life. It will ruin her and make her wretched. If you dare tell her there is no depth of degradation I will not sink to, no pit of shame I will not enter, you shall not tell her. I forbid it. Why? If I said to you that I cared for her, perhaps even loved her. You would sneer at me, wouldn't you? I should feel it was not true. A mother's love means devotion, unselfishness, sacrifice. What could you know of such things? You are right. What could I know of such things? Don't let us talk any more about it. As for telling my daughter who I am, that I do not allow. It is my secret. It is not yours. If I make up my mind to tell her, and I think I will, I shall tell her before I leave the house. If not, I shall never tell her. Then let me beg of you to leave our house at once. I will make your excuses to Margaret. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Erlin, to have kept you waiting. I couldn't find the photograph anywhere. At last, I discovered it in my husband's dressing room. He had stolen it. I am not surprised. It is charming. And so that is your little boy. What is he called? Gerard, after my father. Really? Yes. If it had been a girl, I would have called it after my mother. My mother had the same name as myself, Margaret. My name is Margaret, too. Indeed. Yes. You are devoted to your mother's memory, Lady Windermere, your husband tells me. We all have ideals in life. At least we all should have. Mine is my mother. Ideals are dangerous things. Realities are better. They wound, but they are better. If I lost my ideals, I should lose everything. Everything? Yes. Did your father often speak to you of your mother? No, it gave him too much pain. 
He told me how my mother had died a few months after I was born. His eyes filled with tears as he spoke. Then he begged me never to mention her name to him again. It made him suffer even to hear it. My father, my father really died of a broken heart. His was the most ruined life I know. I'm afraid I must go now, Lady Windermere. Oh no, don't. I think I had better. My carriage must have come back by this time. I sent it to Lady Jedberg's with a note. Arthur, would you mind seeing if Mrs. Erland's carriage has come back? Pray don't trouble, Lord Windermere. Yes, Arthur, do go, please. Oh, what am I to say to you? You saved me last night. Hush, don't speak of it. I must speak of it. I can't let you think uh, I am going to accept the sacrifice. I am not, it is too great. I am going to tell my husband everything. It is my duty. It is not your duty. At least you have duties to others besides him. You say you owe me something? I owe you everything. Then pay your debt by silence. That is the only way in which it can be paid. Don't spoil the one good thing I have done in my life by telling it to anyone. <laughs> Promise me that what passed last night will remain a secret between us. You must not bring misery into your husband's life. Why spoil his love? You must not spoil it. Love is easily killed. Oh, how easily love is killed. Pledge me your word, Lady Windermere, that you will never tell him. I insist upon it. It is your will, not mine. Yes, it is my will. And never forget your child. I like to think of you as a mother. I like you to think of yourself as one. I always will now. Only once in my life I have forgotten my own mother. And that was last night. Oh, if I had remembered her, I should have not been so foolish, so wicked. Hush. Last night is quite over. Your carriage has not come back yet, Mrs. Erlian. It makes no matter. I'll take a handsome. There's nothing in the world so respectable as a good Shrewsbury and Talbot. And now, dear Lady Windermere, I'm afraid it really is goodbye. Oh, I remember. You'll think me absurd, but do you know I've taken a great fancy to this fan that I was silly enough to run away with last night from your ball. Now, I wonder, would you give it to me? Lord Windermere says you may. I know it is his present. Oh, certainly, if it will give you any pleasure. But it has my name on it. It has Margaret on it. But we have the same Christian name. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> of course, do have it. What a wonderful chance, our names being the same. Quite wonderful. Thanks, it will always remind me of you. Lord Augustus Lawton, Mrs. Erlen's carriage has come. Good morning, dear boy. Good morning, Lady Windermere. Mrs. Erlen. How do you do, Lord Augustus? Are you quite well this morning? Quite well, thank you, Mrs. Erlen. You don't look at all well, Lord Augustus. You stop up too late. It is so bad for you. You really should take more care of yourself. Goodbye, Lord Windermere. Lord Augustus, won't you see me to my carriage? You might carry the fan. Allow me. No, I want Lord Augustus. I have a special message for the dear Duchess. Won't you carry the fan, Lord Augustus? If you really desire it, Mrs. Erlin. <laughs> of course I do. You'll carry it so gracefully. You would carry off anything gracefully, dear Lord Augustus. You will never speak against Mrs. Erlin again, Arthur, will you? She is better than one thought her. She is better than I am. Child, you and she belong to different worlds. Into your world, evil has never entered. Don't say that, Arthur. There is the same world for all of us. 
and good and evil, sin and innocence, go through it hand in hand. To shut one's eyes to half of life that one may live securely is as though one blinded oneself that one might walk with more safety in a land of pit and precipice. Darling, why do you say that? Because I who had shut my eyes to life came to the brink and one who had separated us. We were never separated. We must never be again. Oh, Arthur, don't love me less, and I will trust you more. I will trust you absolutely. Let us go to Selby. In the Rose Garden at Selby, the roses are white and red. Arthur, she has explained everything. My dear fellow, she has explained every damned thing. We all wronged her immensely. It was entirely for my sake she went to Darlington's rooms. Called first at the club. Fact is, she wanted to put me out of suspense. And being told I had gone on, followed, naturally frightened when she heard a lot of us coming in, retired to another room. I assure you, most gratifying to me, the whole thing. We all behaved brutally to her. She is just the woman for me. Suits me down to the ground. Ah. <sighs> All the conditions she makes are that we live entirely out of England. A very good thing, too. Damn clubs, damn climate, damn cooks, damned everything. Sick of it all. Uh, has Mrs. Erlin... Uh... Yes, Lady Windermere. Mrs. Erlin has done me the honor of accepting my hand. Well, you are certainly marrying a very clever woman. Ah, you are marrying a very good woman. <laughs> and curtain. Do sit down. And I wish I had known it was your birthday. Oh, sorry, my mistake. Yes, Parker. Yes, my lady. Yes, my, sorry. Child, if you did such a thing, there is not a woman in London who wouldn't pity on you. Ah, sorry. Margaret, what you said before dinner was of That woman is not coming here tonight. Sorry, we'll do it again. I've that. I wish I could sink so. <laughs> One more time, bloopers. I am to myself. <laughs> I am the only person in the world who would like to, I should take two. <clears throat> well, that is no, Im shit, sorry guys. Arthur, I can't bear it any longer. I must tell you, last night. What? <laughs> sorry, I completely missed my cue. <sighs> you knew that to spare her the ignom, ah, shit, I'm sorry. I I tripped over this word every time I tried to read it. Hang on one second. Ignominy. You're good. Grr. Okay. I wish that at the same time she would give you a miniature shit. Sorry. Starting over. A miniature shit? Wow. <laughs> you don't look at all well, Mr. Lord Augustus. Yeah, let me try that again. No, I want Lord Augustus. I have a special message. I'm afraid I took your wife's fan in mistake for my own when I was leaving your house tonight. I am so sorry. What? Okay. It's impossible. No matter what harm she tries to do us, you must never see her again. She is inadmissible anywhere. But I want to see her. I want her to come here. Never. 
She came here once as your guest. She must come now as mine. This is but fair. She should never have come here. It's too late, Arthur, to say that now. Margaret, if you knew where Mrs. Erline... Sorry, let me start that again. Keep saying her name wrong. Actually, stop. Ma yep. yes. I mean, he just realized he was on camera. <laughs> Okay. Lord Continue. Augustus, what are you doing in our room? <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> that was a... <laughs> That was awesome. Do we need to back up? Uh, does it matter? 